Hello everyone and welcome to this week's Product School webinar. Thanks for joining us today. Just in case you didn't know, Product School teaches product management, coding, data analytics, digital marketing, and blockchain courses online and at our 15 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer some amazing local product management events and host online webinars, live streams, and Ask Me Anything sessions. Head over to productschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Hello everyone. Hi. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about different development methodologies, specifically about Scrum and how to do Scrum right. Uh, I'm joined today with my colleague Boris Coleman. My name is Yulia Ertmanko-Palma. I am a certified Scrum product owner uh, and I am currently working as a product manager at HubSpot. Through my career as a product manager, I worked with various product uh, development teams and I applied a lot of different methodologies to develop, build, and deploy software. And today I'm going to be sharing some of the best practices of what I've learned by using Scrum and how to realistically you can apply this framework uh, with your development team. Uh, and as I said, I'm partnered with Boris. We actually worked together. Uh, we managed together a, a development team at Experian, and we'll be sharing some of the common experiences, common knowledge that we've learned throughout that process. Hello, everyone. My name is Boris Coleman, and I'm a certified Scrum Master and a senior product manager at Experian Data Quality. I am a former developer, a development manager, and most recently a product manager. I worked for a small privately owned firm, which was then acquired by Experian. So I've certainly uh, seen agile process done at small and large companies. Like we've been from variants at our company for about six years, and I'm here to share my experience using this framework and some of the lessons learned along the way. So over to the next slide. It's problem. I, I did say that Scrum was a framework, right? It is above all a framework, not a methodology. It's a toolkit. You often hear that Scrum is simple to understand and to learn with hard to master. And I remember not thinking much of the statement when I first encountered it. I thought it's not intuitive for many people. It's something that seems like a simple set of rules and meetings that take many months and years to actually gain efficiency in. This may be a toolbox. Learn the purpose of each tool very quickly, but then when a group of people, namely your team, has to build the together using these tools, especially if it has to happen on a regular basis, things can get very tricky. But we've got a great team where everyone likes and respects each other. We've got developers and testers and maybe some you know, operations folks with loads of experience. We've got this master who really wants to help people and remove their impediments every day. So all that should, you know, given a group like this and the fact that you know, there's a defined product that they're working on, this should take a weeks, maybe a month, right? Well, for those of you that uh, have actually tried it, you know that the answer is not that simple. It's not about the maturity of the individuals or the experience or the friendliness and supportiveness. It is above all about the ability to self-organize. Scrum doesn't really prescribe the way to do the work. It doesn't give you a simple algorithm to follow to deliver software faster. What it prescribes is a set of tools and, most importantly, a mindset. As you see here, you've got three sets of tools that are at your disposal. There's a team that's a development team consisting of various functions, like developers or testers. You've got the product owner responsible for the product backlog or the business requirements. And you've got the Scrum Master that is responsible for enforcing uh, or ensuring that the agile process is followed. The second group of tools are the artifacts. And these are the product backlog and the sprint backlog. You can think of a product backlog as a list of business requirements or user stories as they're often referred to. Each user story has a description, some acceptance criteria, and an effort involved. You know, these product, so this user stories on a product backlog um, are ideally ordered in a, you know, by priority. The third set of items are the events. These are the meetings that take every sprint. So a sprint is an iteration. Could last from two to four weeks. And it's been the start of a planning session. 
planning session is when the team gets together with the product owner and they discuss what the team implemented to delivering the sprint. Throughout the sprint, on a daily basis, the team gets together for a daily scrum or a daily stand-up meeting. This is when everybody synchronizes, gives updates on what they've been doing and what they're going to do next. This is also where any impediments or issues are being discussed. The next meeting is that of grooming. This is where any new stories that have just come from the business uh, are being discussed and scored. So again, it's a meeting with product owner and the team, Scrum Master, everybody's discussing a story, trying to put a, a score against it. Fourth type of meeting is it's a trip. You know, this is what happens at the last day of the sprint. Uh, and this is really a demonstration of recently completed uh, functionality to the stakeholders, where a demo or, or just a, a conversation around the new features that have been added or bugs that have been fixed. The final meeting is a retrospective. This is a lessons learned meeting. We enter the sprint when they teach it together and discusses how the sprint went, sharing feedback, and agreeing on some actions. Uh, and what they're going to do differently. So, these are all very simple concepts, uh, but unfortunately, you know, if you just follow them verbatim, you don't necessarily get you know high quality software guarantee every couple of weeks. Why? Because there are a few major challenges that you're aware of. If you do this right, if you overcome them, certainly. Uh, succeed. The, the big challenge number one I wanted to call out, and this is one of the next slide please, is developing high quality software can only happen if few technicians are met. We also refer to this um, you know, delivery as isn't now really that's the key criteria uh, that is used by agile teams. Like, is the team delivering that value? And this can only happen if the team knows how a chapter is required to jointly deliver software based on requirements. So this would be forecast accuracy. Can we actually predict how long things will take? Product owner, of course, needs to know what needs to be delivered and where it sits in the priority order. So this is the prioritization. Now together, the team needs to be able to break up the little pieces. It's not enough to just say we want to deliver this software. You no, know, you know that within this iteration we can deliver something that is potentially shippable or usable at the last plant. So yeah, this is a product that's shippable product implement. So to put their egos aside, to self-organize and gain predictable velocity together. This doesn't happen overnight. This could take weeks or months. And once that predictable predictability is obtained, the problem will really have the ability to make effective data driven prioritization decisions. The product owner knows how many points a, a given team can deliver in a sprint. I think it comes easy. Uh, they look at the product backlog, they see scores against each of the items, be it a, you know, some kind of a uh, you know, story or a bug fix and so on, they can then combine them to be more particular sprint after next and sprint after next and sprint after next, knowing that, you know, it's almost certain that all of these things will be completed within those time intervals because the velocity, a number of points per sprint is stable. The other item I would uh, call out as a challenge is just dealing with the non-agile wider organization. So if you're doing Scrum, you know, in one area, but the rest of the business is waterfall issue or whatever methodology, they're non-agile, then you could see fail coaching for urgent fixes mid sprint be here to throw there. You can have team managers exerting pressure on product owner and scrum master to deliver faster than the team's velocity. Again, it is very difficult for the team to focus on their work or to deliver a successful uh, product. And 
this is by many seen as uh, this is actually a big challenge that is currently with them in the beginning. So over to the next slide. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the best practice and when to actually use pure Scrum. I did want to say that pure Scrum in reality is fairly rare and that most teams that I've had exposure to are actually using a hybrid such as Scrum then, which has elements of here as well. Assuming you want to use pure Scrum, here's where, uh, where you should use it. When you have your roles clearly defined, and you don't have any conflicts of interest, such as product owner being a line manager for Scrum Master or product owner a line managing developers or a single person acting as a developer and a product owner, things like that. When you actually have people in their clearly defined roles, that's when Scrum is going to uh, be most effective. The other one is on software needs to be delivered to things and roles. Who want bi-weekly releases, bi-weekly releases, um, you know, Scrum is the way to go. And when the project is long running and the same team is working with this, using the same set of tools, same languages, databases, and so on, same technologies, I guess, over a long period of time, we have that gives the team enough time to gain stable, predictable velocity, which makes our donor's job much easier and allows the team to deliver value for a long period of time, predictable. And the last thing that I wanted to call out, again, referring to my previous slides, when the wider organization is ready to embrace Scrum. Doing Scrum on one particular team in a non-agile business will likely cause confusion and even resistance. So these are some of the lessons learned and tips that I wanted to share with you all. Now I want to turn it over to Yulia. Thank you, Boris. Um, so I'm going to go back and try to kind of summarize all of these best practices and um, all the uh, great insights that Boris shared. So we kind of go back and think about when we think of um, things we want to do when we run Scrum within our development team is having a well-maintained and prioritized backlog. That's something that the team will be able to pull the items to focus for a sprint backlog, things that they can accomplish specifically within their organizations, um, and also ensuring that that backlog has an, a clear requirements and definitions of that. And so um, not only are we committing to this work, but we also know that this work is well-defined, what the expectations of this work uh, for acceptance criteria is when we consider this work done, uh, so it doesn't slow the team down and actually allows them to accomplish what they committed to specifically within that uh, sprint timeframe. Also ensuring that the team delivers value to business. That's something that will continuously motivate uh, the team to stay self-organized and ensure them that the work that they have picked up is important. It does bring the value. It does bring um, the priorities were clearly defined and the priorities correspond to the impact, not just the effort of the work. Um, one of the requirements, and Boris kind of pointed out a lot to, to that whole theme, is uh, the team has to be inspired to take ownership of their work, be accountable, and be self-organized. That's one of the key aspects in trusting the team to make these decisions. So we want to ensure that the team is actually capable of being accountable, taking that work, uh, taking it to the next level, and being able to self-organize to execute based on the principles. Um, and then, you know, in return to that team being able to do that, you have to give them respect and you have to trust the decision that they make. So if the team, you know, is saying to you specifically within this spring, these are the things that we can realistically accomplish, um, you have to take that, their word and understand the situation they come from. That creates this mutual relationships where uh, the team has an ability to um, make decisions be self-organized, be accountable for their work. And as a product owner or product manager in this situation, um, you're able to rely on, on their principles of work. Um, as a product manager, you also want to be very proactive and proactively remove anything that blocks a team from executing and achieving their goals because it is a time box sprint. You want to ensure that within that specific time frame, the team committed to doing the work, um, you are very reactive and proactive in solving the problems for them and you don't just um, let the problems uh, grow and that will prevent teams from accomplishing the goals and that is a, a bad thing for overall motivation as well as it allows the, the work to continuously move into the next sprints, which is not a great thing. Um, 
you don't want to focus on iterations and working with an incremental process. So don't build something very complex and very big just because your sprint maybe four weeks. Think about something that can be broken down into what Boris called as a shippable items, right? Something smaller that you can grow into a larger, uh, something you can quickly learn from and something that you can accomplish um, instead of investing a lot of effort and time in building it and then figuring out later that maybe that wasn't um, the best work, right? You also want to work with the smaller teams because it's a self-organized unit, right? You want to make sure that um, there's enough people to actually be able to self-organize without having uh, a very large team where that becomes uh, a bit more cumbersome and it becomes a, a problem. So usually between five to nine team members is manageable enough um, to be productive. You also want to know your team very well. So not just the velocity, strengths, and weaknesses, but the situations we're in right now, right? So if someone is having a vacation or a lot of team members are out on a specific time frame, then um, that's something that you do want to take into consideration because that impacts the velocity. Um, communication is a key from why to where we are in, in terms of progress and what is the impact. I think that brings everything together. It continues the motivation, but it also showcases the value. And you as a product manager can communicate that not only within the team, but with stakeholders, with the users, and that provides that transparency and trust, which is essential to run Scrum within a, a larger organization. Um, you have to use your common sense. I, I uh, stress that a lot uh, and iterate in Scrum. So if you see something isn't working, uh, you shouldn't be just sticking to it because it's part of the toolbox, right? You have to change the process to make it um, uh, fit into your specific teams and bring the value to your specific teams. And that's why, as Boris mentioned, sometimes Scrum, as it is a pure form, doesn't really exist. And that's okay, because that's a toolbox that should be applicable to your specific situation. Um, and if something is working, continue doing so. And that's kind of some of the best practices and learnings. And um, what are the things that we want to uh, ask you to stay kind of away from, right? What are the things that if you find yourself doing, maybe think of changing? Um, so first of all is starting a scrum and applying this toolbox to teams that are not um, able to self-organize or don't have yet a strong self-discipline. Usually it's teams that maybe don't have enough experience or uh, we're just a newer team um, or just engineers uh, straight out of college. They need a little bit of time to um, find their pace understand how to do the sizing, understand how to work together as a team, uh, be able to have this practice of breaking down work into more of a smaller shippable items. And once they have that experience, once they have the comfort of doing so and confidence in doing so, they will be able to then become more self-organized and manage themselves. And that's something you have to watch for. Uh, it's obviously not you know common scenario for everyone. So if you don't have enough work experience, you're unable to self-organize, some teams can, but that's something for you to watch uh, and understand is the team ready? Will the team be able to take on this challenge? And distressing the process. So that's something that ties very well to uh, some of the examples that um, Boris brought, you know, if large organization doesn't trust the process, doesn't trust your velocity, doesn't trust your prioritization or decisions, uh, it will be hard to actually be successful using the framework. So we want to ensure and stay away from uh, distrusting the process and uh, your role as a product manager uh, or as a scrum master always to making sure that you are transparent and you are de delivering value, which will create that trust within the organization. Um, Dr. Inspecting Tim's decision, that's kind of ties it all uh, together as well. If team makes a certain decisions, if that is based on the prioritization that you as a team did, um, you want to respect that and you want to continue building that confidence within the team because that will help their self-organization, but also building that confidence within the organization. Um, run long and productive meetings. We all hate long meetings. Death by meetings, I think, is one of the funniest uh, term uh, in corporate world or in any world. But yeah, definitely, you know, take your uh, critical eye and see there are a lot of different ceremonies within Scrum. So some of them are extremely helpful. Some of them might not be helpful within that specific time frame, right? So if you did um, a great grooming sessions uh, each week and now you don't have anything to groom, don't have a grooming meeting, don't take the team's time let them uh, be more efficient by actually doing the work. Um, don't do a long stand up. It's something that takes a lot of time, right? Because you do it constantly, uh, you do it daily. So make sure that uh, it's no longer than 15 minutes. And kind of, as I mentioned in the, uh, the best practices, iterate on the process. If you see something isn't working specifically for this team right now, change it. Don't just stick with it because it's part of the toolbox. 
over focusing on reporting and tools um, because Scrum does allow you to have all this wonderful metrics and great information. If you focus too much on it, sometimes it overtakes the process and it kind of leads into that distress, right? So if team says, you know, our velocity right now is this and it's changed over time, it's good to understand why, what's contributed to it, but you can't necessarily always be enforcing that specific number or just caring about the sizing or the items um, because that kind of impacts negatively. So think about a, a right balance where metrics help you to inform the overall team health and how to proceed with what is the right strategies to um, correct that, but the metrics don't become just something that you live by daily. Uh, making estimations or commitment decisions on behalf of the team is something that uh, you have to be cautious about as well, just because you know the team's velocity and what's on average, let's say, estimation numbers in use, it doesn't mean that you as a team member have to commit to something on their behalf, because the whole point of this process is that you are trusting the team, they are able to self-organize themselves and they have the final say in the work and the in estimation. Uh, so if you're doing that on their behalf, you're kind of taking away that choice that they have as a team and um, not maybe looking into some of the intricate details uh, of the process that they would be able to find. So kind of working as a team and collaborating with the team is an important factor here. Allowing team to burn out, I think we all, you know, sometimes have aggressive goals and trying to win for business, but it is important to understand that there are times where you have to allow the team to um, maybe be more creative or take a longer time to find better solutions or um, address some of the technical debt. It's not always a win for the win. Um, you have to ensure that there's a proper balance of work and the team has time to recover uh, from something um, huge or a big commitment that they did. And it's actually very good to, to give them that time. Um, you shouldn't allow them to um, burn out at work. Uh, letting work to continuously move from one sprint to another is also something that you want to prevent. And if you notice that it happens a lot, uh, then maybe it's a signal that you want to reiterate your process and change something. Don't stale the process, right? Maybe you want to look at your sprint plans or your estimations, or if you want to break down features into smaller user stories, um, a lot of different things that can be done to uh, prevent that from happening um, and kind of one of the last reasons that I mentioned is a stale process, so not being able to reflect um, on what is really working, with, uh, what doesn't work, um, would usually something that prevents me from successfully running this methodology. So this is a quick summary. Uh, we have told you about everything you know about different um, toolbox of Scrum, what to do, what not to do, how to prevent the team from being dismotivated, and we are hoping you will be able to apply this methodology within your organizations. And if you have any questions, please feel free to let us know. Thank you, everyone.